Welcome to a paranormal show unlike any other. The Ghost Helpers Show with your guides, Tina Irwin and Laura Van Tyne. Where the paranormal is more normal than you think. We are seasoned psychics who once led normal, everyday lives just like you. Until the paranormal world refused to be ignored any longer. We have listened to countless dead tell their stories, and we are sharing that knowledge with you. Join us each week as we take a piece of the paranormal and explain how it works using true ghost stories, the tales that the dead have told us. Our intention is to offer new insights and understandings of the paranormal pandemonium which surrounds that mystical fourth dimension and how it impacts our normal everyday lives. The Ghost Helper Show with Laura and Tina, teaching the living to help the dead, starts now. Welcome, everyone. I'm Tina Irwin. This is Laura Van Tyne, and we'd like to welcome you to the Ghost Helper Show, where the paranormal is so much more normal than anyone thinks, because paranormal stuff happens every day. Well, right? and it can be even crazier. We're going to talk about today some a concept called thought forms. And that's a very, very crazy thought form, crazy idea. But thought You're going to say crazy thought, huh? <laughs> it's a crazy thought that there are <laughs> thought forms, but the concept is, can a thought have a visible form and that's what we're we're really going to talk about because we've gotten several requests to address this so and the address start out with i cross my loved one over and but i think i'm still seeing them or my relative is seeing them or i i talked to a psychic who could talk to that you know my dead loved one that we crossed over what's going on and so our focus today is to address the concept of thought forms. And basically with a thought form, all thought is energy. So if you are grieving someone that you have loved so much and you have crossed them over, but you're still, your grief's a little bit better because you crossed them over, but you're still grieving them so dramatically and you keep seeing them in your mind's eye, or you remember the last time you saw them, basically you are creating a form of thought, a visual thought of them. And the form begins to take shape and it sits inside your auric field. And you basically project this image. It's sort of like, you know, when you talk about computers, you talk about creating an alias on your desktop. Well, basically you created an alias of the person who died. And, you know, this happens and it doesn't make that person a bad person, but it does create the concept of maybe there's a lesson to be learned in detachment. And I'm, I'm going to share with you a story that happens with a client of mine over the course of probably a couple of months. So my client's mother died and she called me and said, could you please help me cross her over because she's still in the house? And of course, and we worked and we crossed her over and this grandma was the center stage for the family, right? The family revolved around this grandma, this grandma organized the holidays, this grandma organized birthdays, you know, grandma lived in the house with this particular family member also, but this house was the extended, is where the extended family would come to the family hub, so to speak. So we cross over grandma and a few weeks later, the teenage daughter or granddaughter starts seeing her grandmother in the house again. And so how could that be? And so this went on for a few weeks and a couple other members started seeing grandma in the house again, even though she was crossed over. Which they didn't see before. After she was crossed over, they didn't see her anymore. They didn't see her anymore. Or sense her or anything. And now all of a sudden they are. Grandma's back. Or is she? And so I got a call and I asking, you know, what's happening, what's going on. I thought we crossed her over and I said, okay, we're going to work together. And when Tina and I do this work with a client, we put in a lot of safety protocols to make sure that we're safe and our clients are safe. So this isn't something that we would recommend people doing at home because there's a lot of stuff that goes on behind the scenes because safety is key, period. It's really not all full of unicorns and rainbows in those dimensions. 
it's scary out there. It can be, yes. It can be scary out there. (laughs) So, and so we err on the side of caution and we help each other where we really, really help each other. We can each do it separately. We, We don't have to have the other partner, but in this, you know, whenever we do do it together, we are one person's kind of holding the space for the other. Yeah. So I work with the mom and the granddaughter and I'm working with them together. The teenager is, you know, 17. So she's old enough to have this experience. She's kind of on that cusp. I would never have done this with a 10 year old or something like that because it's too much responsibility. And karmically, it's not in the best interest of the child at that age. But this this girl was clearly doing something ca- to cause this. So as we're working on, we bring in grandma again. We, they call her in and we're, again, in a safe space. Now, did the, the daughter, the granddaughter bring her mother, her grandmother in? Um, I'm going to say, I honestly don't remember, but I believe so. They were both okay. asking her to come in. So grandma comes in and what I did was I poured a ton of salt etherically, mentally on grandma. Because salt works in every dimension. Salt cleanses in every dimension. And when I did that, the craziest thing happened. (laughs) Because there's no crazy in our world, right? (laughs) So I pour the salt over the grandma mentally. The form of grandma disappears, but what appeared was a dark intelligence. Some type of I'm mean, a demonic being, a shape. It yeah. was a shapeshifter. It was a shapeshifter. That and I have this shapeshifter in a safe space, so it can't go after any of us, and it can't leave this safe space. It basically, I, I incarcerated this thing, which is why it's important to make sure we clean up the ether. So I do this, and I start having this conversation with this dark entity because I want to get as much information from this thing as I possibly can. But I also have to practice due diligence, and that is, is what this thing is telling me really true or what I want to hear, right? So sandwich between the truth are usually a bunch of lies. Is that fair enough? when you deal with a dark intelligence. But every now and then you get a little piece of gold. And so so this thing that's why we do this process. Yeah, this thing admits in a very egotistical manner that he saw this thought form and he popped in this thought form. And once he did that, he connected himself to the granddaughter and he could now read her thoughts. And he and he could manipulate her. And thoughts. he could manipulate her. And here's the scary part. Over those few weeks the granddaughter started cutting herself. That was never in her behavior. That was never in her repertoire in the past. She started cutting herself. She started getting really dark and really depressed. She didn't say anything, but she knew something was wrong. She just didn't know what it was. So look, I'm going to interrupt here just briefly because when her grandmother before her grandmother crossed over or was crossed over, she didn't have, the granddaughter didn't have any self-mutilating ideas. No. Because the grandmother wasn't a harmful person. But now that this thought form was created because of the granddaughter's longing and this dark intelligence joined the thought form and gave it far more structure and it shifted into the shape the granddaughter wanted to see, now it goes through and manipulates the granddaughter into very dark behavior. It's another clue. It's a thought form and not the ghost of your grandmother. Well, and it really, it was alarming to me because it makes me wonder how many teenagers are affected by some type of dark being that you can't put your fingers on. No amount of therapy, no amount of, you know, medication is going to fix this problem. It's not. And I think that people think that things that happen on the other dimensions are just too far out there. But the the reality is they're affecting people on a, on a constant level. And this is where the paranormal is more normal than we think, right? Yes, because it became that family's current situation. I won't call it a norm, but they, you know, other people could see this thought form because this dark being gave it shape. So it's a shape, it shifted into the shape she created in her mind, 
but it was such a dark feeling that it was now impacting the behavior of the granddaughter. And that was nothing logical to do with the grandmother. And so that's why other family members could see it because this dark being gave it structure. Otherwise it wouldn't. And when Laura put the salt on this thought form, the, it, the dark being became instantly visible. And then, you know, she could deal with it pretty effectively. And this karma never wastes energy. We say that a lot. Karma never wastes energy. And what this did was it gave us, first of all, a concept for this radio show, because this is such an important concept that I think I know a lot of psychics out there do not know what the difference is because we haven't been taught those things. And I want to go back to this granddaughter. It didn't make her a bad person, but she needed to understand that death happens to everyone and death is not an ending. Love never dies and death is not permanent. You can have memories of your grandma. You can remember those great moments with grandma or any loved one, but her time here, that grandma's time was over for now. And when we die, it's not, our souls go on. The, what animates us doesn't end either. Every death has a purpose. And when you are attached and holding on so tightly, you begin to shut down those parts of yourself and you go into a place of pain. So if you're having to hold your fist tightly because you're grasping, it's called the grasping heart. It's called attachment. And when you let go and relax your hand, there's no pain when you open up your hand. That's a natural position for your emotional self is to be open, not to be tightly closed. That's a, that's, I mean, that's a painful place to have to maintain the point of death is to learn to let go of someone who has died. It's releasing attachment. And that's an enormously important concept. And part of the family's job was to help the granddaughter to understand that you can let her be in the heaven world. It's her turn to, to be released from the mortal frame. Sometimes yeah. it's really painful to be in a mortal frame if, if you've had a tough death. Well, and if, if a family member holds on to a loved one and does not allow them to cross over, on many levels, it's kind of cruel and vicious. It's almost a torture for the soul who can never leave. So the fact that the family was enlightened enough to cross this grandmother over is wonderful. But the follow on was to teach the granddaughter that it's all right to let go. And actually, we're going to write a course on thought forms to explain to people what's actually happening on even deeper levels. So people can understand this very unusual thought. And by the way, when Laura corralled that dark intelligence and then she removed it, notice the terminology we're using. Laura didn't banish it. I didn't send it off. I didn't. You know, a bury it in the ground. We've heard that one. Oh, I just bury him in the ground. Really? Then what really? happens? It's, it's a, yeah, it doesn't have any, you know, physical structure. How did you do that? <laughs> so it, it's really important for us to properly remove dark intelligences, ghosts, and take them to the appropriate realm. And we have spiritual teams that we also perform due diligence on. We're not going to assume that our spiritual team is really who they think they are. We, we have a series of practices and that vary to make sure because these dark beings are very crafty and we're not here to scare people about it. This is a reality on many levels that no one talks about. But we're talking we're about We're talking about it. And I want to kind of throwing the windows open and letting this breath of fresh air come into these topics so and that they're not dark and scary. And one of the things that I did talk to the granddaughter about, as I said, you know, your grandma has crossed over. What this means is that she doesn't come back to earth as a ghost for vacation. She doesn't come back and forth. It is possible that our deceased loved ones who are crossed over in the heaven world can visit us in our sleep state 
but rarely, but rarely it's also possible. They can help us in a time of an emergency, but these things are more rare than, than non, not rare, more common. These situations where they are allowed to come back are tightly controlled because they do not want souls in the heaven world to influence the living because it's your turn now to be able to process death and to move forward with your life without the interference of those souls who have died. It's a huge concept. It, it really is. And one of the things I talked to her about is the concept of signs, a signed my, a sign my loved one is like near or thinking or whatever it is. And those can happen. Um, just this past week, it was my dad's birthday. And I wrote about this on the Ghost Helpers Facebook page. So if you go to Ghost Helpers, I have a blog on this about what happened to me. Um, I'm at the beach at Dog Beach and with my daughter and our dog, and they're taking off doing their little dog thing. I don't know who's happier about Dog Beach, my daughter or the dog. <laughs> and I realize all of a sudden it's my dad's birthday. And the moment I look down, I see something. And that story is on Facebook, the Ghost Helpers page. So check that out. It's not too long. But at the end of it, it, it I talk about the fact that Signs can happen, but don't also be obsessed about signs. You need to live your mortal life. You need to have these experiences in this life and to live for the signs of a deceased loved one means you're not living your life in the present. And I think that was a really important concept because there's a lot of us that continue to do that, not because we're bad people or anything, but just because we miss so that lesson of detachment is really important. It's hugely important. So now let's go back to understanding a little bit more about thought forms. And let's talk about the science behind them. Okay. We know that energy is neither created nor destroyed. So we have energy within us. All thought is energy. Somebody had to think of the Eiffel Tower or create the, think of building, you know, a computer. A thought had to come and the energy of the thought became manifest in this wonderful computer we're using today to talk to you. And it's with everything, but you're, like you said, buildings and roads and uh, medicines exactly. and all kinds of things. So that which you create in your mind exists to greater and lesser degrees. And, and when you think about something, you think in three dimensions, you think of the color and the form and the texture and how you, you know, how you feel about it. And it, you create these well, things in your mind. And emotions tend to have colors associated with them. And, and this red is, is angry, you know. And you see this with your auric field. And the thoughts are reflected in the form, thought form of your auric field. We were at a restaurant in Lake Tahoe years ago. And I don't routinely see auras unless somebody on the other side says, you need to pay attention. This is dangerous. And the waiter walked up to us and he, for the, I could see his auric field was just fire engine, angry red. And I said, we need to eat very quickly or just leave this food and leave because <laughs> something bad is about to happen. And, and my family said, what do you see? I said, this anger waiter's really angry. And then I said, are, are you having a bad day? And he, he just exploded on us. I thought, well, maybe we released some maybe of that. It's a pressure cooker, right? And he wasn't angry at us, but I could see it and it was red and angry. And if you were to look at, at mother Teresa, you would see this glorious blue the soft you know sky blue or you know envy is this ugly dirty green and we know that certain thoughts have color and they can be reflected in your aura well field. and our you know people will say oh i have a blue aura i have a green aura i have a this aura or that aura well the minute i punch you it's going to be red <laughs> okay that's just how it works <laughs> sorry your aura field changes constantly so someone and i'm not gonna punch anybody okay <laughs> so thank you so much <laughs> our point is that when you go to the mall and somebody gets takes a picture of your auric field you can't run around and say that's what i look like that's what you look like at that second at that but, moment but that no one is ever the same two days in a row it just doesn't work that way okay so there's three general principles of thought forms the quality of your thought think about that word the quality of your thought determines the color of the thought form. The nature of the thought 
determines the form. And these forms aren't just you created a visual of your grandmother. It can be you're creating visual daggers or you're creating visual you, you don't, love. You don't like someone and your thoughts of that person are so angry at that person. It can create thought forms of daggers or anything else. Harmful things. Yeah. Your thoughts are things. It doesn't mean you don't have the right to be angry about something. It doesn't mean that. It's just how are you managing your anger? And so the definite the definiteness, I don't think that's a word, the definite nature, that's correct, of your thought. <laughs> Where's the grammar police? <laughs> determines the clearness of the outlines. Let me say that again. The more definite your thought, the clearer is the outline of the thought form. Sorry about that. And again, they can exist in different shapes and colors. I mean, sometimes when I think about you know, my children and their, their spouses and my granddaughters, I am and my business partner. I'm filled with my glad, husband. Glad I rank. <laughs> I just, I just fill myself with this love and I send it out to them. This just warm, happy, loving feeling. That's a thought form, but it feels so good when I'm sending it. It fills me with well, this delightful energy and I'm sharing it with my family members. You bring up a good point, though, because thought forms have a frequency, right? Thought forms have a frequency. And prayer is a form of thought. We know we send prayer. I'm going to send so-and-so prayer, and we, you know, do this. But if you send someone prayer that's positive and beautiful, and you're sending them this white light, you're sending them form and shape, intention and color. There you go. There I go. So, yeah. <laughs> all right. So what, what does it mean when it comes to wishing and hoping for something, right? Sometimes people create a reality. You can wish and hope for something and you can be afraid of something. Yeah. You can create a fear thought form. That's why <clears throat> we routinely say what you fear the most you attract. Well, and you know, we're living in such a fearful age. I think throughout the world, there's fear everywhere, right? It's like the woman who told me she was constantly afraid of rattlesnakes. And I, that was such an alien concept for me. And I said, really? I don't like snakes. It doesn't matter whether you <laughs> like snakes. She was very specific. She was terrified of rattlesnakes. Well, I don't have to kiss a rattlesnake on the lips to be to know that they're dangerous. I, I just don't even think about it. Okay, that's a dangerous snake. You avoid those situations. Well, and sometimes those, but she kept seeing them everywhere. They were on her back step and everything else. So my, I guess a possibility is, did she, was she killed by a rattlesnake in a previous life? Is that a possibility? I think and that's her, a very possible, very large. That's a very good point. And her subconscious remembers that. So maybe her, her soul purpose, and we talk about soul purposes in the book, past life, soul evolution, past lives and karmic ties, which is an audio book right now. Yeah. Good job. We talk about that because those irrational fears have a basis. So maybe her sole purpose was to overcome the fear of rattlesnakes. As simple as that sounds, it's not so simple. We come into each life to learn the lessons that we may not have fully acquired in the previous life. And if being afraid of rattlesnakes is one of those lessons, then Sometimes you create the thought form that you think you see a snake there that may not be there. If you think you see a snake and it, you want to know for sure, visualize that salt's pouring on the snake. If the snake vanishes, then it wasn't real. If it's real, call, you know, animal control. I did that once. I called the fire department for a rattlesnake. I don't like snakes, okay? I do not like them. And I remember a few years ago, one of my neighbors said, hey, do you, you know, you and your daughter want to go horseback riding? And I'm like, in the hills where all the rattlesnakes are, it's, you know, hot and dry right now. And I, I literally passed on it, right, which was not fair of me to do to my daughter. But it was like, I don't want to be near the snakes. But you let her <laughs> no, no, I didn't. We neither of us went. Oh, okay. okay. I need so, you to clarify well, that. We did go eventually because what happened was I, I'm like, no, you know, thanks so much. And, you know, maybe next time kind of thing because all I could think was I don't want to be near anywhere in the canyon that's rattlesnake season. I, I kid you not, I hung up the phone and I look out on my back patio. There's a freaking rattlesnake on my patio. What you feared the most it's like, came out of nowhere. And okay, so I, call, I literally, I called the fire department. I know that's so lame, but I'm like, 
holy crap. Okay. I'm like terrified of these things also, but that's not what you're referring to. Um, and I, I, I swear to God in my mind's eye, this rattlesnake must've been like 10 feet long. Right. So the fire department comes out and they, they get it. And it was like maybe a foot and a half long. <laughs> and then I realized what I was doing was I was taking my fear and not letting my daughter have a joyful experience. And I realized that was not fair to me. And I called up my neighbor. I'm like, yeah, you know what? We can go after all. So that was kind of like karma. And you not, didn't see any snakes? I didn't that? see any snakes. No. No snakes at all. So that was kind of so karma. Karma like, gave you an opportunity to identify yeah. the lesson. And I'm lucky I live in a small town with a really fast response rate. Because those fire trucks were there fire trucks plural by the way for a rattlesnake <laughs> well they, they had a slow day <laughs> they were there for they were there in like three minutes over a rattlesnake i mean i was fair i was fair i'm like there's a rattlesnake on my patio um i don't think my husband would have gotten such a quick response <laughs> so anyways um when we come back we're going to talk about how water has memory and we're going to talk about actually how spiritual the movie frozen 2 is based on some of these concepts and we want to thank the Oil Lounge for sponsoring this show. And you are listening to Ghost Helpers on Transformation Talk Radio. And with that, we will be right back. How do you feel? Just okay? Well, how about you tune in and get ready to be more with The Healing Hour with me, Doc Martin, every third Wednesday at 11 a.m. Pacific on TransformationTalkRadio.com. I'm ready for your questions, and I can't wait to help you find the answers. Every month, we'll have a new live call-in show with innovative topics and a powerful hour of healing. To learn more about me, visit DrSharonMartin.com. See you there. I'm going to be here. You won't want to miss it. Tune in to The Jen Royster Show, intuitive guidance to inspire your life, each Thursday at 8 a.m. Pacific and 11 a.m. Eastern on TransformationTalkRadio.com. This amazing show is an inspirational hour that will take you on an epic metaphysical journey to discover the spiritual approach to life's greatest challenges. Dr. Jen is an internationally known intuitive counselor, spiritual teacher, and energy healer. Call in for intuitive readings and visit JenRoyster.com for more information. Your eternal purpose is calling out to you each and every day. Are you listening? Tune in to Dynamic Destiny Radio with Coach Pete Cafarcio every first and third Wednesdays at 9 a.m. Pacific on TransformationTalkRadio.com. Learn to be your authentic self and live the life that you were destined for. Learn practical tools to discover your purpose and conquer other fears that keep you stuck in a life of mediocrity. Learn more about Coach Pete by visiting PeteCoaching.com. We remember a time when you could simply form a thought and it would manifest. The harmony was forgotten, but it is returning now. The power of inspiration and awakening radio with Juliet Griffin on TransformationTalkRadio.com each second and fourth Wednesday at 9 a.m. Pacific. We'll take you on adventures through the heart and spirit exploring who we once were. This intuitive healer studied under the guidance of wolves, learning from their wisdom to master a higher frequency for a new state of mind. Visit OneTrueSelf.com. We have all heard and told ghost stories, but have you ever heard a ghost tell you their story? Ghost stories from the ghost's point of view are true tales that these lost and lonely souls have told us. Learn why some souls don't cross over and how you can help them. This is probably one of the most spiritually profound series you will ever read. You can find them at thekarmicpath.com and on Amazon. Welcome back to Ghost Helpers. We're talking about the concept of thought forms, and we're talking about those elements that can create a thought form and what it is. And we're going to continue this concept with the movie Frozen 2 because 
the movie Frozen is actually quite spiritual. We're talking to our producers, Benny and Nate, over the, over the commercial about possibly doing a show on the spiritual nature and elements of Frozen 2. But what we're going to focus on for this show is the concept of water and memory. And water has memory. And that's one of the recurring themes in this film. Water has memory. I, mean, I saw it twice with both, both sets of granddaughters, you know. <laughs> and, and I loved every minute of it twice. And Masuro Emoto is a Japanese scientist who was, the, was among the first people to identify through the use of water crystals that water has memory and it responds to the energy that surrounds it. And how he did this was he would just take tap water and freeze it and show the before. And then he would, he would play Mozart to the Well, he music. would freeze it and then he would take look slices the, of it and look at it under. He would look at this, this, the crystal it created. And the higher the frequency that the, crisp, that the water was faced with or what, that surrounded the water, the more perfect the crystal. The more symmetrical, the more balanced the and crystal. The, yeah, and the more out of balance the energy that surrounded it became, the more out of balance the crystal images were. And if you have hate or anger or pain or s things like that, or a lot of well including rap music because rap music has some horrific lyrics some of it does and one of the things that you can look at um if you his last name is spelled e-m-o-t-o -O, masuro emoto and if you google messages from water you'll see it and he's got slices of crystal where he used the intention of hitler or um mother teresa. love mother teresa and you can see how these shapes change based on the thought intention to that water crystal or the thought forms that were directed at the crystal and he had another example there were reservoirs where the water was in horrible shape so they brought in uh different groups to pray and send prayer energy thought prayer thought form positive energy, prayer energy positive prayer energy to the reservoir over days and weeks and then they tested the water and the difference in the water from people praying over it was simply astounding. And we know that prayer works. We have a great book coming out soon with prayers in it. And we know that prayer works because it's a thought form energy that goes to another person, place, or thing. And Emoto was able to prove through these water crystals that that energy has form and structure. And so now when you look at your own body, when someone says, I love you, or you did a great job, you know, you feel really good, which means- We're that, mostly water. I'm making up the statistics, but is we're like 70% water or something. Well, when we get to 70% water, we die. We Whatever it is. Okay. We're- The higher we, the higher that percentage, the, the more hydrated we are correctly, the healthier the body, but it has to do with how you perceive your own body. If you think you're a bad And the person. energy being sent to your body from other people too. Right. If you're in a toxic family where everybody's belittling and berating you, it's going to affect your body. It's going to affect your health because of those water crystals within your body and many other things, but that's a big part of it. But that's a really big part of it because the, um, uh, I think that that makes just a huge difference to how things work. And in the movie, Disney movie Frozen 2, the whole there's so many elements of spirituality and all psychic ability and all of these things in there but the common thread throughout the entire movie and what's that snowman's name olaf olaf i don't know i forgot that olaf has realized that water has memory and this is the entire theme throughout the movie i don't want to give away the movie but they talk about the memory of water from the beginning of this movie to the end of the movie. And in that, Elsa, who is able to use water on a psychic level, a spiritual level, whatever you want to call it, is able to create thought forms with the memory of that water. And because she could create these thought forms, she began to understand <clears throat> why she kept hearing this voice 
this the sound that was coming at her and there are a lot of details in this film that i think that a lot of people will not fully appreciate perhaps the first time it's not just a child's film there's a lot of universal truths regarding the balance of nature how we treat nature and how we treat each other and i think whoever created uh, the disney writers and animators who created this film did a really a, a remarkable job of bringing balance of, of demonstrating how balance can be returned to nature and to organizations and to groups of people so that we can live in harmony, which is a really beautiful message, especially at Christmas. And, you know, let's talk about the concept. It's not in our notes, but of the mind belt. There are a gazillion thought forms in the mind belt. And that's an excellent point. And if you're not familiar with the term mind belt, if, imagine all the thoughts going up as energy from all the people on the planet. And the majority of them may be filled with fear or worry or anger or resentment. There are large groups of people who are praying and they're sending positive energy. So it, you have this thought soup, for lack of a better word, that represents this, this circulating mass around the planet. Actually, the concept of the mind belt is how they have determined that so many different inventors came up with the same idea for the same invention at the same time. It actually happened to the Wright brothers. They said, how could this guy in France see the same thing I'm seeing? Where did that thought come from? And they don't know who thought of it first, but they both came up with some of the most similar concepts. And you see this over and over and over that this thought goes, if you just imagine this belt of thoughts circulating the planet and we're not alone anymore in our thoughts we are there and our thoughts are bombarded so by electronics constantly if we can start taking away the irrational fears and the hate and the anger it could theoretically start cleaning up that toxic soup of a mind belt and this also is visible on social media we see so much negative energy especially you know, we could say it's with the, with teenagers, but it's you not know just what? with teenagers. It's, it's adults everybody. too, especially when you get into politics on, on, on social media aspects. It's like, whoa. And people forget you need both parties in politics and, and to back away from the negativity of what's happening and with what's politics. true or not true. I mean, the, truth nobody is, has an, any idea what the truth is anymore. It's the first casualty, but it, yet it always comes out. How does that work? Eventually it begins <laughs> to come out. And when you have... Or a group that's constantly sending super dark energy to another person or another group of people, this is the basis of black magic. They're sending black thought to another group. And it's black because negative thought has color ranges. That's where the black magic or gray magic or white magic concepts come from. And actually, this is in a certain way, if you're thinking and you're sending a dark energetic form to someone to hurt or harass them, I've actually seen uh, black magic groups, uh, satanic groups send thought forms of black cats or snakes or daggers that come at a person. No one else can see it because it's and, not directed at them. And it's they're only directed to a person. And their subconscious could see them. Their subconscious can see them and they can't explain it to another person. And so their parents go, I don't understand what happened. Well, of course you don't understand what happened because those thoughts weren't directed at you. And you can't even imagine what that person was feeling. And how many times has there been a police officer who... I'm going to say misbehaves or grossly misbehaves and they have no recollection of what happened. How much dark thought is sent to them? And is there a way to mitigate that? And it's be, to become conscious of what we're saying and doing and to insist that our young people be conscious of what they're saying and doing. And that means that if you're a parent, you need to look into the mirror and ask yourself, what are you teaching? What example are you setting? And another element of thought forms has to do with how um, some of the black tools work, which actually I don't really want to go in. Yeah, that we did a show on the Ouija board and that kind of goes into that 
quite a bit, but I also want to talk about something that popped up on the news. This was on CBS News, I believe. And if you go to Facebook, the Facebook page, Ghost Helpers, I posted this story because there's a woman in Massachusetts, I think Somerset or I forget where, who stole more than $70,000 from her client because she was telling the client that her 10-year-old daughter was possessed by a demon and she needed money to banish the spirit. And I'm using the word spirit loosely because spirit that was the term that was used in the paper yeah. in the article. We don't normally use the term spirit because it's too vague. And what we suspect was happening is that this psychic, because if we're all psychic, but if you're psychic enough, you can target a victim, which is really not good karma. We suspect that maybe this psychic woman was creating thought forms that were possessing this daughter. So her daughter was exhibiting behavior very probably caused and created by the psychic. And that can absolutely happen. And the psychic, it's possible that the mother had been visiting the psychic and the psychic said, you know, I think I'm getting that your daughter is becoming possessed. And she created a reality and she created a thought form and the daughter began responding to what the psychic was creating because the psychic knew exactly how to manipulate the mother and the daughter. And I'm going to go off topic for a second. If you hire a psychic, do your research on that person. And also note that if you hire a psychic, it should never be for a long-term fix. It shouldn't take a bunch of sessions to to fix whatever issue you have going on. They shouldn't say it has to be 20 sessions or 50 sessions. You know, when Tina and I work with a client, we do charge. And usually it's in and out. Maybe sometimes it'll take up to three sessions, maybe. But... We also give the client their homework to do also so they don't have to rely on us. And that's what you really want out of any psychic. You also, we also offer them the opportunity to see how you feel. If you're feeling great, then, you know, we did our job. You don't need us. And if you're not feeling great, let's see what else we can, you know, we can help you with. But rarely is is, it's ever a long-term thing. And, And if we think that the client has a physical situation where they need a physician, an allopathic physician, we send them to the doctor. Yeah. So if you hire a psychic, be smart about it. About it. Do not hand your power over on a platter to that psychic like that mom did with her 10-year-old because she was so fearful for her daughter's life. Uh, one of the things that we have discovered with many people who've taken their own life is that somehow they were sent suicidal thought forms that that began to close in on them like they were it's like this blackness closed in or they were felt like they were in this dark fog this that's what they've told us over and over fact that suicide is contagious is a big deal so if you know of somebody who's committed suicide go to ghosthelpers.com and go to the crossing over prayers and in the upper right is a drop down menu And there is one for helping um, someone who committed suicide to cross over. Because if you die by suicide, you're not going to cross over because your grief and despair was so great. You're not going to be able to see the light that is coming for you. That's a big deal. And so now that person is a ghost. They don't know what to do. They don't know where to go. And they are now hanging on friends and family who also start to feel depressed and suicidal. All right, let's have another example of thought forms. And there is a very powerful spiritual organization that happens to be in Los Angeles. And they send prayer energy to troubled spots on the earth to mitigate the darkness that's in those spots. And it's a lot of people come and they send really powerful prayer. And it's very positive. It's white, white prayer. And there was a film crew, because there's film crews all over L.A., and one night they were filming, and the film picked up this massive white beam shooting out of this building. And they knocked on the door, and they said, "Uh, you're destroying our film, because (laughs) there's this white beam, and we can't get rid of it. Stop the positive prayers for a film, people. And they said, (laughs) oh, we're so sorry, we'll fix that. And they, they stopped praying. They said, tell us when your filming's over, and then we'll go back to sending prayer. And they said... That's what that was, that that white beam, which we can't see with our eyes, but our film is so sensitive it picked it up. And they said, yes, we that's what we do. It's called the Aetherius Society. We send 
positive prayer to the world, to any hotspot. And right this minute, by the way, they're sending enormous hours of prayer to Australia for those fires, the people and the animals and the earth. You know, we had somebody write in earlier this week, last week, later last week about on the Facebook group, Ghost Helpers. And she says, what about the animal souls? which is a great concept because we talk about crossing over the dead all the time, but that also includes animals. And sometimes an animal will get stuck often, and especially in Australia, it's a big deal. If you go to ghosthelpers.com, go to the crossing over prayers, there's actually prayers that you can help an animal cross over. Go to it, play it, set your intention to help those animal souls that are in Australia. That will... That will be very helpful. That will help them to cross over as well. remember, you're sending a positive energy, and that positive energy is really, really amazing. And I want to thank thank her for, I didn't get permission to use her name, so I'm not going to, but I want to thank her for that concept of that question and that we have addressed that, and we do have crossing over prayers for animals as well. And they're free on the website. They're absolutely free. Okay. Uh, we have a couple of, uh, we have another example mm-hmm. of a thought form situation, and this is violent video games. I had a woman in Northern California called me several years ago, and she said, you know, we have all these things flying through the air. We have CDs flying, and we have plates falling off walls, and I don't understand what's happening. And, you, you know, I think we have this horrible ghost. Can you stop it? And I said, okay, I'll do the best I can. And I remote viewed the location and there were no ghosts there, but there were a lot of thought forms, which I dispatched really quickly. And I said, you have a middle child, roughly 13, who's playing violent video games and they've created these thought forms in their head and they have created this and I stopped it. But as long as that child keeps doing this, this will continue. I'm going to be really honest about it as honest as I can be. And she got really, really mad at me. (laughs) Forget this. She said, my kids do not play violent video games. And I said, ma'am, number one, your kids aren't with you all the time. And your other two kids are playing them, but they're not creating thought forms. This middle child is. And I'm telling you, that's what I'm seeing. Agree with me, disagree with me. That's what I saw. I cleaned it up, but it won't last if something doesn't happen with this child. And if you find it, would you please call me back? about about, uh a week to 10 days later, she calls me back and she said, I'm so angry. You were right. And I said, are you angry? I'm right. Or you're angry because of what you found out. (laughs) She said, if you hadn't warned me about this, if you hadn't told me, I would never have guessed you were right. My three teenagers went to went to visit their father, my ex-husband and his new wife and her teenage boys played very, very violent video games. And my 13-year-old was completely wrapped up in them. When I confronted him with it, he admitted that he just couldn't stop thinking about it. And he imagined all these things happening. And so I want you to know I put a stop to it. And I did all those other things you told us to do. And it has stopped. It has not come back. Okay, that was one. Yeah. That was one session with this family one time and it fixed the problem and it completely fixed the problem because I gave the mother knowledge and power to fix the long-term situation. And I was honest. I said, I can't, if your child continues to do this, this will happen again. And he's, it's not a blame. It's just where this energy is coming from. And you need to understand the mechanics of it. It's just a cause and effect. And uh, basically, it never happened again. She never called me again. She said, it is fixed. I have no what's going on now. And teenagers are <laughs> full of energy, right? Yeah, Their so thoughts are energy. very powerful. Yeah. The teenage thought is very powerful. It's not a bad thing. It's just right. you need to have some idea what's actually happening. And I, I did see this happen to one of my kids when he started high school. This super happy person, easy humor started getting darker and darker and darker and more and more depressing thinking oh my god what is this i can't understand it and and everyone said oh it's just being a teenager i said no i don't believe that that is not my son this is what girls do this is what boys do no no it's you can't just say that's what they do because i know this person and then one night he and his buddy it was a rainy night we picked them up they went to a friend's house and they said 
I said, well, what were you guys doing? They said, you know, I know some people don't like it. Those Christian people don't like this particular game. And I said, it's not just Christian people who don't like it. And we all don't like it for a reason. And that reason, it is really dark. So we dropped his friend off and we sat down and we had a frank, not angry discussion. We said, you know, we're seeing what's happening here, what's going on with you. This is what we're seeing. And and we're, we're basically saying, if you continue to play this, this is a very dark road. And we, we're telling you, you have to stop. And the most remarkable conversation ensued. He said, you know, I'm so glad you said that because I couldn't figure out what was wrong with me. I felt like I was getting darker and darker and darker. And I said, well, look at your, your friend. He has chronic migraines. And I'm convinced they're coming from this game. And, and he said, well, I was beginning to get these headaches too. So I'll just tell them my parents said no. And he says, you know what? That's my decision. I'm telling them no. And he never played the game again. It took about three days. I got my son back. The, the, the easy humor, the gentle conversation returned for which I was truly grateful. But we had that frank conversation and I, I got that, that charming person back. And, and I was, I can't wonder how many other families this happens to and the parents don't really understand that level of darkness the nobody farms that are bombarding that young person nobody talks about this and i was having a conversation with my husband there's you know a plethora of spiritual books out there right all over everywhere spiritual books we write them we write them too and all of the best sellers only talk about the positive things and so it's not that we're being overtly negative we're just being honest well, you wear a seatbelt in your car for a reason. Right. And this is a... You lock your front door for a reason. And we're talking about spiritual safety. Spiritual it's, safety, spiritual spiritual health, which directly affects emotional health. And that directly affects physical because everything in your life starts in the spiritual, moves to the mental moves to the physical and the financial and, and, and every and relationships, it all goes back to there. I've had a lot of clients who had husbands who were playing these dark, dark games and divorced them because they, it, they're that husband became a person they no longer recognized. If you don't have your spiritual health intact, it's going to be a really bumpy mortal life. And as much as it looks like you know, we, we try to keep it light. We're talking about death and dark things and black magic. And yet we're got a <laughs> smile on our faces <laughs> because we, we need to keep it as light as we can. At the same time, it's important to understand some of the things that are going on, some of the things that are out there. And you don't necessarily want to run around thinking that bad things are happening. But if you notice something, Take action. We're, inquire about it. We're in a state where everybody's talking about a mental health crisis, an emotional crisis, but really we've forgotten about the fact that they're in a spiritual crisis. And so we're really talking about the soul, the health and well being of the soul. And that is the one thing every one of us has in common is we all have a soul. And the more we can help the soul, the more we can raise that vibration all of these teenagers are killing themselves why it, no potion pill powder whatever as tina says is going to fix this until you start addressing the spiritual components and this is not about a particular religion or whether or not you go to a building of wood and stone it's about every mortal person's connection to god and we use the word god we don't use there spirit. is no healing without god period Period. I mean, it's not an, it's almost like not, it's not a negotiable statement. And if you consider God nature, fine. But right. that connection to nature is divine. And that's our point. With that, we're going to have to Get end here. My high horse here. <laughs> I was tall for it's, a it's minute. A, Sure you were. <laughs> I just pound you down every time you get a little taller. Um, all right. So next week, we're going to talk about organ donation, crossing over prayers, and imagine the, the help we can give people along that road. This is going to be an amazing show next week. You will not want to miss it. We've this. crossed over a lot of organ donors, and we, we really want to share this because this is extremely important. 
Yes, and you, it's a remarkable how many people are having them. I think some, some hospitals do 100,000 organ transplants a year, so it's going to be an amazing show. So thank you for listening to Ghost Helpers. We want to thank the Oil Lounge for sponsoring us. We want to thank our producers, Benny and Nate. And be sure to check out our books and our courses on ghosthelpers.com. Did I forget anything? And check out the Facebook page, Ghost Helpers. And we've got some information there too as well. And with that, we will see you next week.